Okay, uh, we're standing in a, uh, a stand, an upland hardwood stand. Um, it was harvested in 1982, um, 34 acres. Um, it's a uh, type day 53, which is a white oak, red oak hickory stand on a site index of about 60. Um, and one of the things we came out here to look at and see if we uh, could still do some good with the intermediate treatment, a crop to release treatment. And looking around here, if you're looking at the uh, uh, diameter at breast height, look like you might be able to do something. But um, if you look up at the crowns, some of these oaks that we would be choosing to release have already established their dominance or maybe they're in a co-dominant position. For instance, um, looking at an oak right here, um, its crown is obviously um, in a at least a co-dominant position and still got space and room and uh, space around the crown where it's free to grow. So um, after looking at the rest of these crowns uh, and the position, crown positions of the oak trees in this stand, I feel like this is probably uh, differentiated and most of the uh, the input, the cost to do good in here is sort of passed by maybe five, ten years. So this is a stand we would choose not to do crop tree release. So one, another important uh, um, critical thing we found with crop tree release here in the Southern Appalachians is we select the Forest Service, by, what I mean by we is the Forest Service selects it. So we, we've got people that, that are trained to do this. So if you leave it up to the contractor, you can have a widely varied result. But if we're choosing the crop trees, I think we get a much better result. Um, and our, our choices are oaks or hickories that are in the intermediate or co-dominant class. And this particular one, we've chosen this uh, white oak even though it's in the intermediate crown position, but it's a long live species and we feel like it's worth saving. And we, if you notice here, we've got a circle on that tree and a circle on this tree while this one's banded. And that tells the contractor that Although these two trees are interfering with the crown of this selected crop tree, we don't want you to cut those. We feel like this one can actually do pretty well with a two-sided release. Now that kind of nuanced marking is not something a contractor wants to take into account. They just want to get in there and, and do the work. So we're happy to do the marking because I think the final result is much better. Let them come in here and read our, our paint, get the cutting done leave the marking to us, we found that we get a much better result. All right, we're standing in a, uh, a 23 acre a unit that uh, we've just completed uh, in 2018. We just completed a intermediate treatment um, called crop tree release. Uh, this stand was harvested in uh, 1986, and uh, it's grown up pretty tight stand. Uh, there is competitive uh, oak that was in here, but there is um, a plethora of red maple and other competitor species. Um, so when we decided to actually go ahead with this treatment, the stand was about 30, 31 years old, a little bit on the older side of uh, crop tree release. Uh, we went ahead and uh, decided to go ahead and treat here because there was some competitive oak. We were able to use the stumpage re receipts from the sale on the Shelterwood unit uh, we just saw uh, to actually fund this treatment, which is important because um, uh, if you don't have the money, you can't do the work. But this stand, uh, about 23 acres in size, it's site index 70. It's a uh, forest type 53 red oak white oak hickory so our objective was to come in here and look for competitive oak meaning in the co-dominant intermediate class uh, we didn't choose we didn't, weren't in here to choose any of the dominant oak because they don't need the help it's the co-dominants and intermediates 
so um, where we could find them and there was plenty of uh, options in here um, for instance right here we've chosen a white oak species that was sort of in the intermediate crown class and instead of releasing it on all four sides we we just chose two sides because the other two trees on on in the two of the four cardinal directions were also oaks that were in good position so here we've chosen to release a, an oak two-sided release and over here we've got a oak that was uh, in the co-dominant crown class I'm guessing and uh, we've rele released it on all four sides and it was surrounded by red maple and you can tell by the large stumps um, so the again the objective was here to keep oak in the competitive crown positions and I think we've done that I think where we probably missed the mark here is the contractor overachieved they cut too much around these trees and what I mean by too much they cut some of the smaller uh, trees that weren't competing with the crown of the crop tree that we designated it was just near the tree so that's something we worked with on the contractor to not cut those trees that are immediately around it that's not competing because it can shade the bowl of the tree and prevent that ep epicormic branches you know you lose a lot of energy when that epicormic branches starts to take place and some of that energy instead could be going up more into the crown um, so yeah the, uh, the the total I can't remember the total number of trees in this 23 acres but it worked out to about 16 to 17 trees per acre which is a little bit on the low end but you know we, we don't have unlimited money in a perfect world we might choose 50 trees 50 crop trees per acre but at least 16 to 17 crop trees per acre we're maintaining a pretty healthy oak component in the future stand okay we're standing here in the in a group selection opening on the white rocks timber sale on the eastern divide ranger district in the southern appalachians uh and outside of blacksburg virginia this particular group selection is probably between an acre acre and a half in size um, the prescription area we're in is the dispersed recreation area it's got some visual uh high visual objectives concerns on the other side of the road which is just up out of the site uh, is a uh, mountain lake wilderness area and just maybe not even a quarter mile up there is the AT the Appalachian Trail that um, in some points you may be able to look down and see into this timber sale so there was a political decision made by the district ranger even though we had the option of doing some regeneration here to keep this as a uh, thinning with group selections and the group selections were kept to less than a uh, two acres for that reason we didn't want to create these big huge openings because of the high visual objectives for this area so this particular group selection uh, was just below the road it's uh, without at that uh, the view shed of areas up there where um, the Appalachian Trail could look down in you could be on that trail and look down and see into this timber cell but the um, part of the objective was here was to get some oak regeneration back but um, at the same time there was an effort to add some value to this timber sale so the thinning even though we were only doing thinning there would be enough uh, value to, to attract a purchaser to come in and do the management here as far as the success of oak regeneration uh, it's very mixed bag here uh, just looking around I don't see a lot of oak regeneration uh, competitive oak regeneration and what I'm referring to there is probably uh, stump sprouts uh, after the treatments after the harvest we came in here and did mechanical site prep in this area and then the following year we followed up with a chemical treatment treating the stumps of the competitor species red maple yellow poplar black gum um, I think we did we were successful in treating those stump sprouts but what's what's been a problem is some of these other uh, seed germinated species like poplar and cucumber and red maple so not a lot of uh, 
oak regeneration in the group selection itself, but we've started the oak regeneration process to a degree in the matrix. So there's a limited amount of sunlight coming to the ground now. There's more sunlight that was coming, coming now than there was before. So we've started that regeneration um, uh, process in the matrix itself. And again, probably less than 5% of the overall acres of this 317 acre sale was in group selections. The vast majority is in the thinning matrix. So um, how long did the cut take? How long did it take for the bid to pro uh, processed? So the NEPA document was signed in 2010. Uh, we prepped the sale in 2011, and I believe we awarded the contract in 2011 or 12. I'm not sure about that. But the sale lasted, supposed to, it was supposed to have been a three-year sale. It got a couple of extensions for varying market-related uh, circumstances. But this particular unit did not finish um, cut out until fall of 2016. So it took almost five years. And that's reasonable for a 317-acre thinning. That's a large sale. You're not taking out as much volume per acre, but there's a lot of acres to cover for a purchaser. And uh, what what type of follow-up treatment do you foresee or is on the books in terms of the plan for this site? I know you mentioned the matrix and what you're getting with some of the shaded areas in there with the mid-tolerance, but over here in this open area where you're not seeing competitive oak regeneration establish. Well, uh, yeah, we, we're planning to monitor this area and in the future we could do a weeding treatment where we could sort of nurse whatever oak or hickory or hard mass producing species in to a competitive um, uh, position and then maybe 20 years down the road if we still have maintained some oak or hickory we could do a crop to release treatment in here in any of the group selections as a matter of fact the, embedded in the this 317 acre sale are old group selections from the early 90s and we've gone in there and looked at those group selections and because there wasn't any follow-up treatments it's largely devoid of oak there are a few areas where some oak maintain the competitive position but by and large it just proves that on these higher side indices, deeper soils, north aspect, you've got to do some treatments follow up to maintain oak in a competitive position. Looking north, this unit was 57 acres, and it had, I think there was. In this one, it was like six group selections. One of them was, well, you can see it, the opening is right over there. Um, we're in a uh, prescription area that's uh, referred to as dispersed recreation, but it's suitable for timber uh, production management. It's a uh, upland hardwood. It's a Typed a 56, a yellow poplar, white oak, red oak. And the site index ranges from 80 to 90 here. So pretty high site index. The year of origin of this particular unit was 1912. So it was, uh, when we proposed it, it was slightly under 100, 100 years old, but uh, obviously uh, it's past that age now. Um, the yellow poplar is a major component of the canopy. This sale was uh, awarded in 2011, and this unit was completed. The harvest here was completed in 2016. And the prescription here was, as I said, it was a thinning with embedded group selections. The, the prescription for the thinning matrix was to leave a residual basal area of 60 to 80. And by and large, we did okay. We're probably on the high side here, maybe up around 80 or 90. But our choices for removal were, um, we were the objective was try to, to reduce the overall oak component 
in the canopy because of the gypsy moth threat. In 2008, 2009, the gypsy moth had a uh, big population boom. And on three of the four sides of this area, it was within a mile or two. So we, were, we knew it was going to come in the future. We were trying to reduce the oak component before that happened. This is a big visual concern area. We've got wilderness right behind us, 300 feet up on the other side of the road. The Appalachian Trail is just up here, maybe a quarter mile, and you can view some of this unit. And then again, the, the gypsy moth, we were concerned about uh, its future impacts on this stand. It was so heavy to oak. The oak component was probably buried between 70 to 90% of the canopy here. So we were trying to reduce the overall composition, the oak composition in the stand. These uh, group selections were typically, uh, they varied from a half acre to an acre and a half. And since then we've come in in these group selection areas and we've uh, done site prep, mechanical site prep and some follow up uh, chemical treatments to try to knock back uh, the competitors to oak, things like uh, yellow poplar, black gum, striped maple, red maple, um, and it, our success has probably been mixed bag. Some of the poplar is so prolific, it just keeps seeding in. But there is some oak coming back in those group selections. We also, in the thinning matrix, we've been treating the thinning matrix with herbicide to try to knock back some of the uh, stump sprouting from the cucumber, yellow poplar, to try to get favored the oak regeneration that's in the understory, whether it came from stump sprouting or it came from seed germination, acorns. So uh, we're looking out into um, a uh, recently harvested stand um, uh, over in the uh, Potts Mountain uh, area on the Eastern Divide Ranger District. This particular stand is uh, uh, 32 acres. Um, it was oak dominated, upland hardwood oak dominated stand, uh, probably up over 80% of the uh, canopy was made up of oak species. Forest types 53, red oak, white oak, hickory again. The site index is uh, about 60, a little in the mid 60s. The year of origin was 1922. So when we harvested it, it wasn't quite, or it wasn't quite a hundred years old. So uh, we're standing in a prescription area where um, it's uh, a black beer emphasis. In this particular prescription area, uh, all, was almost completely devoid of any early successional habitat. And the, the size of the prescription area was up around 10,000 acres and they only had less than 100. So the short term goal was to create early successional habitat with the regeneration treatment. Um, and uh, by, by Doing a shelter wood cut, we were uh, the objective was to retain 15 to 25 percent. Excuse me, 15 to 25 square feet of basal area, and those uh, trees that we chose were either current den trees or healthy, mass-producing oaks, uh, primarily long live oaks like white oak, chestnut oak. The long-term uh, uh, objectives were to maintain uh, the future canopy of this stand was to maintain it in at least 50% oak. So we are actually bringing down the overall percentage of oak in the stand, um, as well as to manage for uh, gypsy moth, which is in the drainage water shed, and also oak decline. Both um, oak decline was present in, present in the stand when we did the um, the recon and gypsy moth was close by so we were both um, had both of those in mind when we prescribed this treatment um, 
as you can look out there, uh, there's a, uh, there is some oak stump sprouts coming up. I don't know if you can see the dark red or the orangish red, but there's also a lot of red maple in there. So um, this particular unit did not have a uh, chemical treatment. Uh, we missed a year coming in and treating after it got harvested. Uh, we still have that capability, but right now we, there is a need to come back here and treat those stump sprouts, red maple, black gum, um, striped maple, some of these competitor species to maintain that, uh, that oak component in the future um, uh, stand as it grows. Um, again, this is a black bear emphasis area, so black bear requires a mix of habitats and there's almost no early successional. So this particular 30 acre unit was part of a larger project, which we're trying to create up to about 600, 650 acres of early successional. And in the sale, we have some other prescriptions where we're doing some thinning with groups, group selections and other regeneration treatments. A um, couple of items in this particular stand. Uh, in, in the NEPA project, we determined that if um, a potential bear den tree was present in the stand, we would protect it and buffer 100 feet around it. One potential bear den tree was identified, so there is a leave area, probably a little less than an acre, where we've just completely uh, not treated, not cut any timber at all out of it. Um, there was a couple of SMZs in here we protected. And within the matrix of the unit, there was a blowdown from probably 20, 25 years ago. We kept it in the unit to order a, in order to harvest whatever merchantable timber it was. And then post harvest, we were treating the stems that were non oak in there. So couple of unique things about this stand. And we uh, do some regeneration cuts. One of the issues is deer browse. So if there's no early successional habitat there or very little, when you create it, the deer population gravitate to those openings and they just browse the heck out of it. And that's what's going on in one of the other units for sure. I haven't spent much time in this one, but uh, the size and the species makeup of the oak that was in this stand uh, made it um, possible that we could uh, shoot for 50% of the future stand as being oak, but it's been heavily browsed. And just walking in here, I see plenty of black gum stump sprouts red maple, a lot of poplar seedlings, but not a lot of the uh, oak stump sprouts. This one obviously has plenty of oak stump sprouts coming in, but a lot of these other stump sprouts, the oak stump sprouts just have been browsed so heavily. If you look down there, You'll see a, um, a strip right there devoid of, of vegetation that's um, just timber slash. Instead of uh, re-vegging that with uh, like a grass mix or anything like that, we, we choose to slash that in or do the erosion control with water bars and slash that's already on site and just cover the bare areas. So we're trying to, trying to uh, reduce the amount of opportunity where non-native invasive species would come in and every time we introduce a seed mix or or mulch like straw or something we're always possibly reintroducing so we choose to slash these uh skid trails and temporary roads in with the just a timber slash on the side So we're standing in uh, a uh, stand that uh, originated in 1918. Uh, forest type 
upland hardwood forest type 53 red oak white oak hickory the side index here is about 70 um, but this stand is one of many stands that's in this burn block that's approximately 1300 acres this burn block was burned in 2018 it had not previously been burned so this was the first entry so um, it was a combination of hand and aerial ignition uh, aerial ignition uh, initiated the uh, um, the sequence up top on the ridge and they nursed it down and control line was this uh, road out here this asphalt road but had three uh, had a lot, lot of objectives but the three main objectives were fuel reduction lots of fuel in a stand that had never burned before uh, mid-story removal and you can see this these are white pines and right in this microsite it actually achieved that very well took out most all the white pines and thirdly to begin the oak regeneration that is person almost non-existent because there's no light getting to the ground so you get rid of that mid-story you start to regenerate oak if there's seedlings and um, germination um, so 2018 uh, was the first burn. It was pretty successful. There were some areas that got too hot and there were some areas we probably didn't get it hot enough. But when you're doing that big a burn and the landscape, the topography is diverse, it's hard to get it all right. Um, but my personal opinion is you can do better job with torches, hand lighting as opposed to aerial, but you're limited by time and um, costs um, and across the road when we get a, a picture of that you'll see what this looked like before the burn there's impenetrable mid-story understory of white pine and some other species one thing you do uh, when you when you uh, have successful burn is you open it up to some of these uh, invasive species like autumn olive that is the seed is there and once the light starts hitting the ground, things start popping up, not just oak seedlings. So we're going to have to do something to control this if this persists and gets worse. It's all internal. We consulted with a couple of private landowners who have adjacent land, let them know the day of the burn. Um, one was supportive, one was not supportive. But um, uh, on other burns elsewhere, we do have some multi-agency burns. There's one in another county that we're working with the uh, town of Pulaski and working with the state agency and we actually burned there this past year. It was a big burn so we had to pull folks or ask for help off of other districts adjacent to us. Yep. You still have to request a burn permit. It, it all runs through the state agency and there's a formal process that we do this every time we are trying to pull off a burn. are on um, the Eastern Divide Ranger District. Um, we're out on the Kelly Flats area and we're doing uh, what we're going to walk through what a stand exam would be like. Um, so common stand exam or CSE for short um, is really the tool, the on the ground tool we would use to inform management. Um, you can't just write a prescription or decide what to do with a stand without actually having the data to back it up. Um, so what we'll be doing is I'll be kind of going through the basic field protocol. Um, and what's great about stand exams is that it's a national program. So the protocol can vary regionally, but um, you know, the codes are going to be the same um, and the protocol can be adjusted to fit your local conditions. Um, so say you have a management project where you're really interested in, um, you know, like gypsy moth salvage or something like that. Um, you can actually tailor what things you're going to be collecting on the ground to fit your project needs. So the first thing, stand exam, obviously we're gonna be, we're here at Plot Center um, and there's three different levels of um, intensities you can do for your stand exam. So the first one would be quick plot, um, the second one would be extensive, and the third is intensive. So as you go up on the spectrum, the more things you'll measure. Um, and here in region eight, uh, we do a lot, I mean, depends on what, obviously what 
your silviculturist is interested in collecting. Um, but we're going to be doing an extensive plot, so kind of the middle ground. We won't be doing any collecting any fuels data or um, surface vegetation. But the great thing about stain exam is it's all in, um, all been documented really, really well. Um, so the first part, um, I wish you could. Obviously, most everyone now is using PDRs, but for the sake of kind of demonstrating it. Uh, I printed out what one of the data sheets looks like. <laughs> so we'll first go through, um, say this is our first plot. Um, you first collect like plot based data. So based on your stand, you know, what's at this plot, what is the slope? Um, so you would use a clinometer for that, um, I guess. And I would be shooting, you'd be kind of looking what the plot you're at if there's you know, if it's kind of hilly and up and down versus if it's just kind of flat or kind of the slope is going towards one way. But I would use my handy field assistant here and I would be shooting them um, to kind of get an average of what the slope would be. So, I'm just gonna... And I think right here, this is a high elevation old pasture site. So the um, aspect here would be Probably all. Right. Yeah. So that's another good point. And it's pretty, pretty flat here. Um, so that's one of the things you would be recording. And then another thing that's really important, um, this is also going to help, you know, when we take all this data back, you can run it and make, generate really great reports that can help really inform the prescriptions. Um, and one of those would be, you would need to know at this moment in time, what is what is the existing vegetation? So that's the EV code. Um, so that's another really important thing that you would collect uh, when you're out here. And that's based on like right now, not um, what's the dominant vegetation. So in this one, we would be... Oak pine? Yeah, this would probably be in the oak pine group. So you would look in your handy dandy book and look for the code that would correspond. So then the next step, we would go into our tree data. So I would be standing at um, plot center and then depending on your plot, your sample design, which you can change depending on what you're looking to collect. Um, right now we'll be doing it using a 10 basal area factor prism. And we're going to be measuring 100% um, sample of what's in um, for this plot. So, and you include for this, this we'll be doing live and dead and you'll write in if it's live or dead so wherever north is which i don't have my compass <laughs> i can help you with that good north is okay. so starting at north we'll work our way around this plot So with the prism, obviously you want to, your eye, the prism is plot center. So you want to be moving with the prism. So that bad boy is definitely in. In? So this is tree one? Yep, that's tree one. And another thing we would be doing, um, you know, with a stand exam is you're also capturing the quality of the site through site index. So normally would be measuring, would be boring at least one site tree. And then we can also capture growth, um, radial growth and height growth. Uh, DBH on this tree is 22.1. 22.1. Would you like to know the species? Yes. Yeah. Pitch pine. It's, it's called a pitch pine, which I believe is 126. Have it somewhere. All right, 126, 22.1. And then we would also be capturing, um, to go along with site index, we also want to get, you know, how healthy this stand is in terms of um, crown ratio. So that can tell you a lot. So with that, you would just be taking what portion of the crown is live compared to the total height of the tree and getting a percentage off of that. So that's another thing we'll be taking with every single one of these trees.
And right now, Mark is getting the height. Ready for the height? Yeah. Measurement? I am. 80 feet? 80 feet. So it almost looks like, Mark, I don't know if you can see it from your angle, but for crown ratio, does it look like about, it's about half or? I'm going to call the crown ratio uh, probably 60%. 60%. All right. Got it. And then another thing we'll be looking for on each one of these trees, if there is um, damage and the severity of that damage. So um, say this one had a really big cat face from, you know, past, you can obviously tell in this site there's been fire. So that would be something you'd be looking for too to record. You're looking for uh, damage and defects? Yep. So uh, there has been some prescribed, prescribed burns in here, so there's a lot of char, but I don't see any damage. Great. So yeah, we won't have to worry about that. All right. So then you got this little white oak here. You called it a white oak. You're stealing my job. Oh, sorry. <laughs> So the DBH on tree number two, 11.4. 11.4. And as you already mentioned, it's a white oak, and I believe that is 802. 802. Yeah. As I uh, try to get the height on this, there's definitely some fire damage on this side. Probably up to about six feet. Okay. So with that, you would go into your, use your handy Danny Field notebook. Since I definitely don't have these damage codes memorized. Um, and just go through and record um, that that tree has fire damage. because the leaves are off, but I can look at the, the fine branching up the top and try to calculate where the live crown is. Looks like it's about, live crown would be about 35. 35, got it. didn't say it, but this is a live tree. Oh, yep. Got it. Okay. So, next in order would be the lovely specimen. <laughs> this also is a white oak in poor shape. It's uh, 8.4 8.4 inches dbh and it's got some serious problems a lot of uh, fire damage i'd say in the first eight feet okay and um i'll get a height on it
37. 37. 37 to the top. Live crown. Let's say 15%. Okay, 15. So as you can see, you know, we are working our way across this plot um, and we would be capturing everything that fits into this 10 BAF uh, variable radius plot. And then the next step would be, you know, depending on your sampling design, which you again get to pick, it's flexible. Um, you'd be doing your um, 100th acre fixed radius plot to kind of capture, you know, stems, you know, under five inches, or you can also set those um, parameters as well, but to kind of get a picture of what's regenerating in this stand. Um, and that can be, you know, a, you're allowed to use tree counts so you don't have to measure every stem. It's, obviously you can't measure a lot of these stems if they're, you know, under four and a half feet. Um, so we measure a lot of the, t a lot of the times in this plot, we're going to be, you know, a count and it's going to be based on height. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of the stand exam in a nutshell. Um, Obviously, if you do more intensive plot, you can do um, kind of capture down woody debris. You can do Brown's transects. They even have fuel models. You can, you know, input pictures. Um, and it's a really, really powerful tool um, to really get that diagnosis of what's on the ground to inform your management. <laughs>